guys. Welcome to Cryptids Canada. I hope everybody is having a great day. So as you guys know, I don't usually do a lot of dogman stories. I just don't get them that often. And I've had this first one for quite some time now and recently received the second one. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to do them both at the same time. So make sure to stick around for the second one. And a reminder for those of you who want to enter the contest for Bigfoot Finder's book, you've got two days left to get your emails in. And I'll leave the email in the description box. All you have to do is just say you heard about the contest through Cryptids Canada. Okay, guys, no more jibber jabber. Let's get to the videos. Okay, so this one actually took place in a small town outside of Vancouver, British Columbia. Okay, so uh, the email starts out, Hi, I'm hoping that you take stories other than Bigfoot. If not, it's okay. I had been born and raised in Vancouver, but my parents were fed up with how dirty it was starting to look. Drugs were rampant, and the city we knew and loved was being overrun with people who had no love of our beautiful province. So, back in 1980, we moved to a new town of Maple Ridge. I was in grade 11 when we moved there, and I was pissed because I wanted to graduate with all my friends, the friends that I had grown up with. So, I went through a bitter and depressed state. We moved to a brand new subdivision, and there was only three other houses besides ours. This night that I'm writing about was a Friday night. I begged my parents to drive me over to the old neighborhood so I could hang out with my old friends. When I did that, I usually stayed with my grandparents, but they were gone for the weekend. So I was stuck at home. And that was awful for a teenager. So where we lived, there was mountains all around us. So I was having a pity party while I sat on the front porch. I could hear my parents inside watching TV and I really did feel all alone. My girlfriend had broken up with me, and I felt miserable. So I decided to go for a walk towards this mountain and trail system with creeks that were full of salmon, and I had recently started smoking. So my parents had no idea that I smoked cigarettes, or pot, or drank. It was about 7.30 or maybe 7.45. It was the first week of May. It was still light out, but it was stormy and cloudy. So I discovered this trail system weeks earlier when my parents came to do some measurements. My girlfriend came with us. When we went to smoke, we came across these trails then. Absolutely amazing. Totally in nature. So, as I said, I was feeling sorry for myself. I recalled her and I sitting on the same bench, watching the fish beside the large creek, and the mountains off in the distance. Then I heard a loud splash just down the creek, but out of sight. I listened for a minute, and then I started hearing growling sounds. I knew it wasn't a bear, but if it was a dog, it had to be a wolf because it was a sound that was very unnatural to me. All these years later, with all the experience that I've had, I still can't describe the sound of that growl that I heard that day. I began to sneak down the path to see if I could get a look at what was making this noise. And then I saw a flash of gray fur as I leaned my head back to see through a spot where the bushes were missing a little. Then I saw it was two wolves that were standing up and fighting each other. I didn't think anything of it as I had seen bears standing and fighting in this manner. Then I saw that each wolf was holding onto the opponent's mane with hands. A fear ripped through my body when I saw that, but at the same time, I knew I had to get a closer look. I crept up, making sure to stay well hidden from them as best as I could. Leslie, I can't for the life of me get this image out of my mind. They both looked alike. They both had very silver-colored manes with black fur going down their arms and ending at the wrist area. Their hands were black as well, but it was just skin 
with very, very sharp nails. I noticed the one that was facing my direction had silver colored eyes. As terrifying as all that was, I could understand it. It's nature. These things happen in nature. But what I saw next wasn't natural. It wasn't something that we see in our world. It opened its mouth to bite its opponent, and I saw it pull its tongue back and show rows and rows of teeth. I don't know if maybe I was in shock from seeing the eyes, the hands, and the teeth, but all of a sudden it slowly turned its head and it looked right at me. And then the other one turned its head and also looked at me. I think I said to myself that I had one minute to live. And I tried to understand that, and I started to run. And I heard them coming after me. Then the next thing I knew, I took a nosedive on the gravel pathway, and I slid to a stop. I automatically wrapped my hands around the back of my neck because I was expecting them to try to go for my throat. I laid there, and after a while, I started feeling drip, drip, drip on my arms and hands. It was taking so long. It was like everything was in slow motion. And then I heard gravel. I heard, hey, are you okay? Hey. And then they said, he has blood all over his arms and hands. Go call the cops. So I thought it was safe to turn over. It was two guys about my age. They helped me up and asked what happened. And I said, I must have tripped when I was running. The kid asked why I was running. I just shrugged. I started wondering if I had hallucinated it all. Or maybe I'd hoped I had. The one kid said, How did you get all those drops of blood on your arms and hands? I just shrugged. They asked if I had a cigarette that they could borrow, and I said, Yeah. So they walked with me towards the new house. It turned out that they went to the same school as I was going to and they were in my grade. So we ended up being good friends out of all of that. But it wasn't until a few years ago that I started looking into what I saw that night. My wife and I were visiting her parents when we watched Van Helsing's Werewolf in 2019. I just sat there in shock. I tried to keep my panic from showing, but my father-in-law looked at me and he nodded, and I knew he had seen them too. I also knew that whoever made that movie saw what I saw that night as well. I've tried to invite the conversation with my father-in-law. He almost tells me, but then stops. It's the same as me. I convince myself to confide in him, but I can't find the words. So that's my story. Signed, Pete's Dragon. Wow. Well, Pete's Dragon, I'll give you a little piece of advice. Find the courage to talk to your father-in-law because you may get to a point where you can no longer talk to him and you'll regret not doing it. And I say that from experience. Okay, that was a good story. Let's move on to the next one. So this one takes place in the 50s near Bowling Green in Scottsville, Kentucky. Hello, my 94-year-old grandfather passed away about six weeks ago. But before he passed, he told me something that he had never told anyone in his life. He said I could write it out and send it to you if I wanted to. He has always listened to you since you started, and then a few other channels. He had the biggest crush on you and always said, Can you check if my young lady put a new video up, lol? We would have the best banter back and forth about all the different cryptid channels, who was doing what and who said what about who. It was all just done in fun. I'm so thankful that he had developed this interest in this topic because I'm sure it gave him a real zest for life, whereas five years ago he had lost all of that. One day, a few years back, you did a story about a dog man. We listened in, and I noticed Granddad was quiet after he turned off YouTube and sat down to dinner. He asked where my father was, 
because at the time the three of us were all living together. Since then, I had to put Dad in an assisted care facility. I was Dad and Granddad's main caregiver, and my dad wasn't comfortable with me taking care of his private needs as Granddad was. Granddad was easygoing as they went. Also, my dad thought Bigfoot was a load of hooey, lol, so Granddad didn't like saying anything in front of him. But if Dad was elsewhere, it was Granddad's favorite topic. So this day, Dad wasn't having dinner with us. As I mentioned, Granddad was quiet after your Dogman video. I had heard of Dogman, but wasn't exactly sure of it before either. So Granddad said, I saw one of those things. What things, I asked. One of them Dogman things Leslie talked about today. I was a little stunned to hear him say that. Here's a little info about Granddad. He hates liars. He would say nothing before he would lie. He had an amazing sense of humor. He loved humor, but he didn't create the humor. So when he said that, I knew he wasn't joking. I asked him if he wanted to talk about it, and he said, Well, why do you think I'm mentioning it? I gave a laugh, and I said, Okay, I'm listening. He said he took a job doing some demolition and construction on a large piece of property owned by a family member of a friend of his in the early 1950s, when he was in his early 20s. At the time, he was living in Nashville, Tennessee, which is where we always lived for the most part, and his friend contacted him to see about him working for his well-to-do uncle. So Granddad drove the five or so hours to go talk to the man about the job. In those days, it was a much slower drive. Granddad said the property was between Bowling Green and Scottsville, and they wanted Granddad to take apart an old church slash schoolhouse that the family used generations and generations earlier. They figured if the wood was still in good shape, they could use it to build a small barn up by the house. So the first day Granddad arrived to start the job, he was shown his room, which was in a guest house on the property. Then Granddad and the owner drove over to the church slash schoolhouse. He told Granddad what he needed to do, how to take the wood down from the structure board by board. They had originally built the little building for the family to use as a church or a place for the family to worship and gather. And then they turned it into a little schoolhouse for the locals to learn. But that didn't last long and the building sat empty for decades. Granddad took the day to settle in and the next day he drove over to the church house to start working. He said he was in the middle of pulling down the outside of the back of the empty building for several hours when he decided to go inside out of the sun to eat his lunch. He thought he heard noises coming from under the floorboards. And then something caught his eye, and he looked out the hole in the wall that used to be a window, and he watched the largest wolf he had ever seen. He actually felt fear, but was relieved that the wolf was running away. He said he never realized that wolves were capable of running at such a high speed. Granddad was a country boy, but not at all familiar with wolves. He said he watched as the shiny black wolf ran towards the old cornfield, but stopped at a big tree. Granddad said he nearly did a number in his pants when he watched the wolf get to that tree. Then it stopped and turned around to face him, and the darn thing stood up. It stood there watching him. He said the fur on its stomach was silver, and then on the sides it started to turn black. He said he thought it looked like it had been nursing, but he wasn't sure. Its arms hung down to at least its knees. They didn't look natural at all. I asked about a tail, and he said, oh, yes, it had a large, bushy tail. He stood there as long as he dared, and then he ran out to his truck and drove to the main house and requested that the owner come outside. He didn't want the family to hear 
and upset them. He told the farmer what he had seen, and the man said there had been rumors of a demon dog for a few years by other farmers. So he went inside and he got a couple of rifles, and they drove back to the church or schoolhouse. Then they walked around the building because Granddad swore that he felt and heard the floorboards move. Sure enough, behind several thick shrubs, they saw where the dirt had been hollowed out. They heard a horrendous roar coming from the other side of the cornfield, but they couldn't see anything at first. The farm owner said, Look, you stay here and guard this hole. I'm going to go get a couple more fellas and deal with this problem once and for all. So Granddad asked what did he mean, problem, and the farmer said that come calving season, every farmer loses several calves all around these parts. And then, last year, there were no more attacks. So everyone thought the problem was gone. And now you see, son, there's proof that the problem is back. So Granddad stood guard, and then, about a half an hour later, several pickup trucks started showing up. There were two boys, a little younger than Granddad, and they opted to crawl down into the hole and see what they could find down there. They yelled back that it stunk really bad, and then they heard two gunshots, and the kids came out a minute later dragging the carcasses of two exact versions of its mother. All of the men stood there looking at these two oddities of nature. And then Granddad said, look over towards the cornfield. And they all saw the giant wolf pacing back and forth as it glared at the men. The two teenagers dragged the carcasses and put them in the back of their trucks to bury them somewhere. Granddad said that they looked very much like full-grown black shepherds, except their front paws had hair-covered hands like a human's or a raccoon with long, sharp claws, not nails. All the farmers stood there and talked. They made plans to lock up their livestock as well as they could and keep guard on their farms all night because it was definitely back and it would look for revenge. And they were sure of that. Then that night, Grandad and the farmer were sitting on the farmer's porch, keeping an eye on the farm, and they heard shots being fired from down the road. So they jumped in the truck and headed down the road. Then they saw the dog man on all fours limping across the road, and the farmer ran up behind it to finish the job. They stood there, and the word started to travel about 11 p.m. that night, and pretty soon there was about 12 men and the two teenage boys who got the younger ones earlier in the day. You could see that it had been lactating. Granddad said that what he could recall the most was that someone opened its mouth. He said the teeth were extremely large, maybe four inches, and each tooth was jagged, and the front teeth were sharp points as well. The size of its head looked like that of a buffalo. The fellas all figured that it was about seven feet tall. It took at least four of them to lift it into the back of the pickup truck that the teenagers were driving. The next day, they were going to bury it beside where they had buried the pups. But when they got there, the pups were already dug up and gone. We all saw that they were gone. Granddad said that he requested to have use of the farmer's rifle as he worked on the building. He said there was a feeling that didn't sit well with him, and when he finished the demolition, he turned down the offer to build the little barn. Granddad said that the owner understood and said if he could get away, he would too. Granddad got on with his life and put all of that behind him until the day a few years ago when you told that dogman story. I know he felt a lot of guilt over that time in his life and I think that talking about it helped him to feel a little bit better. I have to say that I am so happy my granddad and I had your channel as a common interest. You sure did make a very old man and his grandson happy. Thank you for that. Signed, Rennie Smith. Oh my goodness, that was 
Wow, what a story. Um, Thank you for the compliments, Rennie. I really, really appreciate it. Anyways, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed these stories as much as I did. I don't often do dog man stories because I just don't get them. But by all means, if you have them, send them in and I'll do them. Okay, guys, I hope you all have a good night and we'll see you back here in a couple of days. You know I love you and bye for now.